us to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4. Let's read God's word together now. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychicus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou ware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus, Eurastus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. Eubulus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. And so far we read God's word. May he add his blessing upon that. Now we turn in our Heidelberg Catechism to Lord's Day 35. Let us read this faithful summary of the scripture as it explains the second commandment. What doth God require in the second commandment? that we in no wise represent God by images, nor worship him in any other way than he has commanded in his word. Are images then not at all to be made? God neither can nor may be represented by any means. But as to creatures, though they may be represented, yet God forbids to make or have any resemblance of them either in order to worship them or to serve God by them. 
But may not images be tolerated in the churches as books to the laity? No, for we must not pretend to be wiser than God, who will have his people taught not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever wondered why we do what we do when we come here? Why we have singing, offerings, a sermon, and hear the Ten Commandments and read the Bible and the other elements. Why do we do those things? And especially when you think of the preaching part of the worship service, why a sermon that is consistently 45, 50, or even more minutes than that, a pretty lengthy sermon? Why do we do these things? And maybe you've been approached by someone in your life, maybe multiple times, a visitor, let's say, who's new to Christianity or someone outside of the Reformed and Presbyterian tradition, and they come as a visitor to church, and they say afterward, it was really quiet a lot of the time, and sort of solemn. I'm not quite used to that. Why, why do you all go about worship that way? And it's not just when a visitor asks, but we have to know, every one of us, why we worship the way we do. And we're going to get the answer to that this morning. That answer comes out of the second commandment, which addresses these sorts of things. Last time, first commandment, whom we worship, this morning, second commandment, which has to do with how we worship that whom, how we worship God. The second commandment and our worship then, that's the big picture this morning. Let's consider, first of all, the principle, and then second, the practice, and then third, the theology. The principle, the practice, and the theology. There is a principle in the second commandment, and it is this. We must worship God only as he's commanded us to do it. We may not worship God in any other way than he has commanded us to do so in his word. When you hear the second commandment in church, And then when you hear that principle that I just stated, perhaps you wonder, what are the dots that connect those two? How do we get that principle out of the second commandment? So let me explain that. As you know from listening to the second commandment every single Sunday morning in church, it has to do with graven images or a likeness of something. Let's get that language before us once again. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. A graven image is uh, an object. Maybe it's carved out of wood. Maybe it's made out of stone or some other material. But it's some sort of object, a thing. One example of a graven image or likeness is that it may be carved out of wood or made of stone of some creature in the earth. And so the second commandment refers to different 
places that, that might be found. Maybe in the heaven above so that birds that fly in the sky or the sun, moon, and stars in outer space, maybe an object of, is made, a representation of one of them. The commandment talks about in the earth, maybe it's a four-footed beast like a leopard or a cheetah or a bear, and an object is made that looks like one of those. Or, says the commandment, in the waters under the earth, a fish, a blue whale, and you make a, an object that looks like that. Now, about creatures, about those things, we have to be clear, the second commandment does not forbid making a graven image or a likeness of a creature, period. It's not as if you have a, 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 a statue of a bear or a picture of a beautiful bird or something like that, that that's wrong all in of itself. Of course not. But what the commandment does forbid is that some graven image or likeness of a creature should be made and that we would use that to worship God through that thing that we would worship God or that we would worship the thing itself, which is why the Catechism carefully says, question 97, are images then not at all to be made? And then the second sentence, as to creatures, though they may be represented, yet God forbids to make or have any resemblance of them, either in order to worship them or to serve God by them. But when it comes to God himself, and let's include in this category Jesus Christ, never under any circumstances may a graven image or a likeness be made seeking to resemble them. So, the question and answer 97 says, are images then not at all to be made? And then right away it comes out, God neither can nor may be represented by any means. A painting or a picture somehow depicting God? A little replica of Jesus in one's living room? A crucifix of Jesus' body hanging on a cross which is nailed to some wall in a church? Or, what might hit a little closer to home, a movie, which is popular nowadays and has been for some years, movies that show Jesus' passion and suffering. All of those things, seeking to represent or have a likeness of God or of Jesus Christ, are wrong, period. They're sin. That's what the commandment forbids. And as the catechism says, you just can't. It's impossible to try to put God or our Savior into a book with a picture or a movie or a statue or a replica or the such. And it may not be done. But what you can already begin to hear, I hope, is that the commandment has to do with the way in which we worship. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. That one has to do with whom we worship. Don't have any idols. Don't have any other gods that you're clutching before the face of God, that you're trusting and loving in. No other gods. First commandment has to do with whom we worship. Second commandment, though, does not have to do with whom we worship. Second commandment this morning has to do with the way in which we worship this one only true God. That's the difference. The way in which we worship him. God is saying, in essence, 
don't use a graven image or a likeness of me or Christ or any other creature in order to worship me. There's a way in which you may, and there's a way in which you may not serve me. That's the second commandment. And it's right there that you have a timeless principle. The Lord is very concerned with how we worship Him. You see, beloved, the second commandment is not merely about graven images and making likenesses of things. If that's all the sermon was about this morning and that's all the second commandment concerned, well, then you'd leave church and say, well, that didn't really have a whole lot of relevance to our lives because I don't have a crucifix here in church and I don't have a little replica of Jesus in my living room and I can't think of the last time I've seen a movie of the passion of Jesus, so it doesn't really apply to me. But that's not all the second commandment is about. When God forbids graven images and likenesses, he's giving the principle, I'm concerned with the way that you worship me. And the catechism dives right down to that principle. You see that? When it says, what doth God require in the second commandment? That we in no wise represent God by images, but now look, it broadens way out to something that applies to the New Testament as well as the Old, and it says, nor that we worship him in any other way than he has commanded in his word. This has to do with our worship and the way we're doing it right here in church every Sunday, and therefore the second commandment is timeless and very much relevant for every single Sunday. We must worship God only as he has commanded in his word. That principle is something that we call the regulative principle. Regulative principle. Sometimes people say, we may do things in church so long as God does not forbid it. But that's not the regulative principle. If you go along that line, we may do things here so long as the Lord doesn't say no to it. That opens up a whole can of worms to a whole lot of unlawful things. That's not the regulative principle, but it's this. We must worship God only as he has commanded in his word. Call it regulative because God regulates, he rules over, and he has the say about what we're doing in worship. He regulates it. And where you will find those regulations, those commands of the Lord and what he requires of us in church is right here in the Bible. We must worship him only as he's commanded us to do in his word, which means, beloved, we must be very, very careful not to do what we please in worship. That would be a violation of the second commandment. Sometimes we call that will worship. I'm just doing what is according to my own will and wishes, it's human regulated worship. Man decides what he's going to do, which is really just rebellion against the word of God and a life of worship that's cut loose from the word of God. It's will worship. Where does that come from? Well, we heard last time that our sinful nature is a manufacturing machine of idols. Same thing here. It really comes from our sinful nature. I want to do what I want to do in church. But it's driven by culture. 
What's the culture nowadays in 2024? Well, that's so often what governs the things that people do in church. Here's a big one. What's going to entertain me? Because we have a whole bunch of people in society that if I don't have these shorts on YouTube and these quick, snappy videos I can watch, and if I can't have things instantly in a microwave, and this and that and the other thing, quick, 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 go, go, go. That's the culture we live in. And so it's no wonder that worship in church slowly turns into that in so many circles as well. What's going to entertain me? And it better not be too long. Sometimes what determines worship is what the young people want. And what churches find to their dismay is that they conform themselves to what the kids and the young people want, and church turns into that, and then the young people after a few years leave anyway because they say, we don't want that, that's shallow. And sometimes... It's just mere tradition. Why do we do what we do in church? Well, it's because this is what the church, the denomination, whatever, has been doing for 50, 100, 200, 300 years. So why would we do anything different? That's why we do it. My dad did it. My grandpa did it. But if it's wrong worship, it's just going along with those traditions in a wrong way. The Bible gives an example, many examples of this. One of them is Cain. Here was Cain, and you children know from catechism what he did. He brought these vegetables as his offering to the Lord, and they didn't have blood. Of course they didn't. They're just the fruits of the ground. Cain knew very well from his parents, who knew it from the Lord, that he was supposed to bring, like Abel did, a bloody sacrifice. But here he brings bloodless vegetables. That was Cain saying, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. will worship. One example from church history of human-regulated worship is what the catechism calls books to the laity. Question and answer 98 but may not images be tolerated in the churches as books to the laity? No, for we must not pretend to be wiser than God who will have his people taught not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. Roman Catholic Church, especially in the Middle Ages, would have, let's say, pictures or statues, and they would say, these are like books for the people. You understand, a lot of people in the Middle Ages, being a period of darkness, could not read. And so the leadership in Rome reasoned, well, if these people can't read, let's get them pictures and statues so that they can have a visual of who God and Christ are. Not every catechism is asking about that. Should, should those sorts of books to the laity be tolerated? Absolutely not. Because when Rome took all of that clutter into the church, they were really saying, we're going to do what we want to do as far as worship is concerned. God's evaluation, beloved, of will worship, when we find that in our lives in some respects too, and we'll get to that, is that he's angry with it. And that he's full of anger when the Bible is tossed aside and trampled over. He says... You must worship me only as I've commanded you to do so in my word. That's the principle of the second commandment. But what does that look like in practice? You must worship him only as he's commanded you in the Bible. But now when it comes to an hour and a half, two times every Sunday in church, 
what does that principle look like as it's applied to what we're doing here, our practice? I want to bring to your attention two main areas in which the regulative principle is put into practice and applied in the worship service. The first area is that God commands you and me as to what it is that we're doing here. And what I mean is the elements of the worship service. And there are various elements. Why don't we open our Bibles together? After all, the regulative principle is rooted in Scripture. So let's look at proof for the things that we do in our worship service. One of them is singing psalms. Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. Verse 16, which concerns singing and its importance. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So we have singing in church. 1 Timothy chapter 2 few books over. I will not re read all of those verses at the beginning of the chapter, but I just have you know it has to do obviously with prayer. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And maybe just note in our times of political upheaval that it goes on to say pray for kings and all those who are in authority. But prayer is commanded of us in our worship. Singing psalms, praying, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 brings out the importance of Bible reading. First Thessalonians 5, verse 27. And here Paul says to the Thessalonians about the epistle which he just wrote, I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. It was common for Paul to write a letter. And here you have an inspired writing and that letter would be brought to that particular local congregation and they would read it reading scripture and besides singing psalms prayer reading the bible there are also two sacraments one of them is found in matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 very significant words of jesus shortly before he ascends. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that's baptism. And then the other sacrament, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And here again, I'll just let you Scan, verse 23 and following. And here Paul is addressing with the local congregation at Corinth the Lord's Supper, showing this isn't just a thing that they Jesus institutes and then it sort of ends, but this is a practice and a sacrament that goes through the New Testament. Paul talks about the Lord's Supper. And then there's the element of offerings in our worship. 1 Corinthians, a few chapters over, chapter 16. Verses 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, 
Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. All those elements God says, I command you to have in your worship, regular principle. But if you've been paying attention to that list, you see that there's been so far one glaring omission. And that's the preaching. 2 Timothy chapter 4, the passage we read. And here, beloved, we really come to the very heart of the worship service. This is the center of all the other elements of the worship. They're all important, but this is at the center. So Paul says to young Pastor Timothy in the first two verses of chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Congregation, so important is the preaching of the gospel. That's one element out of all of them that the Heidelberg Catechism explicitly mentions. Did you notice that? Answer 98. When it's talking about books to the laity, it says, God will have his people taught not by dumb images, but by the lively preaching of his word. It's like the catechism is saying, out of all the different things you do in worship, this is the one thing we're going to call attention to because it's at the very heart. Even from an architectural point of view, if someone just randomly popped into our church, that was not even familiar with Reformed churches, and you ask that person, when they came into the sanctuary, what was maybe the main thing that you noticed when you walked down that middle aisle? Chances are they would say, well, what struck me is that there's a pulpit right smack dab in the middle of the platform. So whatever you do, Behind that pulpit must be the main thing at your worship service. And you would tell that person not familiar with us. That's exactly right. Even from an architectural point of view, main piece of furniture here because this, this is the main thing that happens. That's why we don't have little stories and a few jokes or a short sermon, but a thorough explanation of God's truth and gospel. It's God's wisdom to have us taught by the preaching of the gospel. That's all we need, and that's all we could ever want. What a glorious thing God has been given. We don't have to turn here, but for example, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. How could you ever put that into a book, in a painting on a page? How could you ever visualize that in some sort of statue? Our God is holy, 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 and he meant for himself to be preached in all of his glory and majesty as the great God that he is. That's his will. Or what about Revelation chapter 1, starting at verse 13? 
And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. How in the world do you ever try to portray that on a screen or in some object? It can't be. The Lord meant for a passage like that to show the glory and majesty of Jesus Christ in the preaching. That's his wisdom. And to have that good news of who our Savior is and what He's done for us at that accursed cross preached. What more could we want? That's how He shows us His glory and salvation. Big point here. We must worship God only as He's commanded us. How do you put that into practice? Number one, by having certain elements in your worship service, including and at the heart of which is the preaching. But the second area in which we put the regulative principle into practice in our worship, besides those specific elements that God has commanded of us, is how really in our heart now we're doing those things. His command touches upon that too. We must worship him, beloved. And I must too. Sincerely. You know, it's possible to be physically present in church, but not really at church. It's possible for the lips to move during a psalter number and for wind to be coming out of my mouth, but to have a heart and mind that is completely disengaged. And it can be that I'm sitting upright in the pew, fully awake and alert, staring straight at the minister while he's preaching, but be worlds away. And maybe even to come to church and say the Apostles' Creed and listen to the sermon politely and do the singing and all of those things, but be angry with someone maybe in my life or to be nourishing some sin in my life, well, then that's not worship really coming sincerely from my heart. Beloved, the Lord will have your heart when you come here. And nothing less than genuine, deep from the inside, sincere, heartfelt worship of his name. And that's why Jesus says to that Samaritan woman, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But not only sincerely, also reverently we must do so. Reverence is a matter of the heart. Standing with awe and trembling before God as being in his very presence because that's what we are here in his presence. Psalm 89, verse 7. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. That sort of awe 
And reverence is going to reflect itself in a lot of different ways when we come here on Sunday. That, that is, it's going to show itself on the outside, this thing of the heart. But let me just choose one way. The way we dress. When you have an important job interview, you're not going to come there in your pajamas. And you're not going to come there in any sort of informal clothes, but you're going to dress up. How much more when we come into the presence of the living God who is holy, holy, holy. Again, this is a matter of the heart. The preaching is no place to get legalistic and say there were this or there were that or were this. It's just to say, we, we could be dressed to the nines and have a heart very far from God. That's entirely possible. But when we have a reverential awe before him, that will show itself in dress and in so many other outward ways too. Sincere and reverent, but he also commands of us joyful worship. Think of all of those psalms about joy and thanks and gladness. There are way too many even to enumerate them. Sometimes we say worship services ought not to be like funerals. I think what we mean by that is when we come here, they ought not to be like someone has just died. But maybe we could go to the positive side of things and say, Worship services ought rather to be like weddings. Of course, there are so many differences between those two, but they ought to be more like a wedding in this sense. Weddings are solemn, and they are serious, and there ought not to be any joking and messing around at a wedding. There are vows being spoken. But at the same time, we all know that for lack of better words, weddings are bright and cheery. You can see it on people's faces and you can hear it in their voices. There's just something about a wedding, solemn but bright and cheery. Isn't that a balance for when we come to worship the Lord here, that we do so with joy? So that if someone comes in here from outside of our churches or outside the Christian or Reformed tradition, that they would see evident on our face and see it in, and hear it in our voice. These people are a joyful people and they want to be here because the good news is proclaimed of what Christ has done for them. Joy. The Lord will have that of us too. God grant these heart attitudes by the power of his spirit. But that principle, we must worship God only as he is commanded in his word, and the practice of that principle in church, the elements of the service and how we're doing those elements, both the practice and the principle are rooted in theology the truth about God. He is sovereign. We are his subjects. He's king. We are his servants. And therefore, he must be obeyed without question as the absolutely sovereign one. But not only is he sovereign, he's wise. God has determined that he is glorified in this specific form of worship that he has commanded of us, at the heart of which is the preaching of the gospel. And all those different passages that we read together, it's as if the Lord is saying in all of them, this is how I have you to do it, because this is the way I'm glorified, and that's the important thing. This is my wisdom given to you. He's sovereign. He's wise, and he's majestic. Think of those passages now again. High 
and lifted up, Lord of hosts, the one about whom we read in Exodus 19, verse 8. And now I'd like you children, too, to imagine that you're at Mount Sinai. It says there, in Exodus 19, verse 18, rather, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended up as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And then when the Lord starts speaking, listen to what the people say to Moses. They say, speak thou with us. That is, Moses, you talk to us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us lest we die. That's what it is like to be at Mount Sinai. But that teaches us we have a majestic, high and lifted up God, and it's into His presence that we come when we come here into church. Oh, yes, He'll have sincere, reverent heart. But besides sovereign and wise and majestic, he's also our covenant friend. And this goes back to what we heard last time. Exodus 20, verse 2. He brought them out of the house of bondage. Remember what we said? That implies he brought his people into his own house. And that's what he's done for you too. In Jesus Christ, he's brought you into his house and brought you nigh unto himself by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're his children. We're his friend servants. And he says, now, I've brought you in. Worship me only, first commandment, and worship me in a certain way, second commandment. I'm not a spectator here in the pew. I'm a participant. And I'm not passive, but very much active. And I'll do what I do in the elements with great joy because I'm in the presence of the one who took me into a relationship with himself. That's the momentous thing that Sunday is. We ought to live for Sunday, beloved. Live for it. We meet our friend here. To hear the commandment with its principle is convicting enough. But then to hear about how all of that's rooted in theology and the truth about God that's a pinprick, not a pinprick. That's a stab, even more. Because now I realize, maybe more than ever, he's sovereign and wise, but how often, with the way my heart is when I come to church, have I not thought I know better than him? And he's majestic, but how often have I not in my mind and heart made an image of him when I came here angry or frustrated or with some sin in my heart and I really just dragged him in my own mind out of heaven and I made something of him that he's not. And he's my covenant friend. But how often didn't I wake up on Sunday morning and think it was just a chore and an obligation to come to church? You see, congregation, we're all guilty of will worship and how far our practice departs from principle. The Lord's angry with sin and he must punish it. And that's why I'm so thankful that the centerpiece of the worship service is gospel preaching. 
let us repent and let us look in faith to that one cross at which is the very heart of the good news. In his blood and in his wounds, there's comfort and peace, trembling sinner, for you who look to him in true faith. And on the basis of what he did there, there's forgiveness for sin. Forgiveness. And in that cross, there's power to go in your life on the Sabbath day and to begin to obey this second commandment in heart and life, worshiping God as he commands. Amen. Father in heaven, our sin is great. Every single one of us, even when we seek to go about one of the holiest activities, really the holiest activity of this life, as worshiping before thy very face here. And so we're thankful for that forgiveness of sins in Christ's blood. We pray for that, Father, and we ask that thou wilt give to us a strength that we do not have in ourselves. Strengthen us from on high to begin. We know that it's just in a small way, but that we may begin to worship thee in spirit and truth. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen.